The interview is being conducted for the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress. The veteran's name is John Brunskill. He was born on September 14, 1971. He served in the Army during Operation Enduring Freedom Afghanistan. He achieved the rank of Corporal. We're recording this on the 29th of September, 2013. I'm Jeff Fulton. I'm conducting the interview. No relation. All right, John, if you would tell me where and when you were born. Uh, Lander, Wyoming. Uh, it's uh, just a little city in the, middle of, uh, in the middle of the big desert of Wyoming. Okay. Do you have any brothers, sisters? Only child. Uh, lots of uh, aunts and uncles and cousins, but only child other than that. Okay. What did your parents do when you were growing up? Uh, father was a commander in the Navy, and mother was a school teacher. Okay. So, when you were out there in Wyoming, how long did you stay there uh, growing up? Uh, growing up, uh, I went back and forth uh, between Wyoming, Nebraska, Vermont, Texas, and that's pretty much it. Okay. So, I, I moved back to Wyoming several times uh, for my mother for her job. Okay. What was, um, just talking about your life out there in Wyoming, uh, what was... Were you moving uh, based off of your father's position, or? Uh, no, my parents were uh, divorced uh, when I was three. Uh, really, the the move had to do with finding teachers' jobs, which were hard to find at the time. That's why all the the movement was going on. Okay. Um, and that uh, uh, there were just uh, a lot of jobs for teaching in Wyoming, and uh, my mother uh, likes the state and just kept gravitating, you know, back towards that. Sure. What, um, <clears throat> I understand you didn't join the military till five years ago, so let's talk about your life prior to the military, and then we'll talk about what led you into joining. Uh, what was, uh, when you were going through high school or whatnot, you were obvious, did you go off to college anywhere? I did. Uh, I went to several different colleges. Uh, okay. I did, uh, I did some semesters at University of Wyoming, uh, University of Colorado, Colorado University, um, and let me see, Texas A&M for a semester, and um, I think that was about it. I didn't quite complete a semester at uh, an Ivy League college, so. Okay. What were your... What was your degree focus? Degree focus was uh, architectural drafting. Okay, what, what got you interested in that? Uh, there was a really good trade school that was uh, associated with the high school that I went to, and it was just an interest of mine. Um, primarily on the artistic side, uh, I was doing at the time a lot of, uh, a lot of the artist renderings for, uh, for future buildings and homes as well as the, the uh, actual plans for those. So that was a big interest and it just uh, blended into college itself. Were you able to use that degree or um, aspects from that degree in your future jobs? Uh, I wasn't, I wasn't. When I came out of college that market completely tried up um, and I found myself not really enjoying uh, an office environment. Uh, there was, uh, because there were so few jobs, I felt that uh, a lot of the draftsmen were being treated pretty poorly. And uh, I decided to go ahead and, and get out of that line of work uh, fairly quickly, even though I had a degree in it. There just didn't seem to be an immediate future uh, in that career field. Okay. So what did you go into after that? Uh, I went into, uh, I went through quite a few jobs, actually. Uh, one of the one of the jobs I did right afterwards is, because of the artistic background, I went into uh, tattooing. Okay. And I did that for about 11 years in several different states, uh, Colorado and North Carolina and Texas. What, um, so you were able to use that creativity while doing tattooing. Uh, what did you like most about that? Um, what I enjoyed most was the, really the, like you said, the creative aspect, being able to uh, take people's ideas who weren't artistic and, and put them into uh, graphic design. Um, the, funny enough, the, the permanency wasn't really 
my end game. It was the, the fun of creating the, the art itself, and I just happened to tattoo it after that. Okay, you said that you did that for about 11 years. What did you start doing after that? During that time, I uh, started doing uh, private, uh, private security um, for uh, more high-end clients. Uh, in North Carolina, you're required to be a private investigator, so I got that license and started doing a lot of private security. It rotated to outside the country for a little bit, and from there, um, it just, it, that kind of dried up too, unfortunately for me. And I rotated then into the firearms industry. Okay. So what got you interested in doing the private security? Uh, I had several friends who did it. Uh, a couple former federal guys, Secret Service and FBI. Uh, that I've known for a few years, uh, funny enough, through tattooing. And uh, I've always been interested in, in firearms and it ended up being a requirement, of course, for doing the, the job. I went to several schools that they recommended and just started working with them from there. Uh, at first it was very easy to get work to do that. There was a lot of call for it. So the, the main reason I quit was because the American jobs really dried up and they wanted you to go to South American countries which were phenomenally dangerous to do that kind of work in because of the just the political climate and the you know the the literal guns on the streets in Mexico and South America. And you said you did work overseas while doing the private security. What were some of the countries that you went to? Uh, Mexico was a primary one. Uh, we went to Brazil several times uh, to do it. Some of the other countries really don't allow for private security or they're, they're not very keen on it. it. It takes a lot of extra money to do it there. And there were so many people doing it that it wasn't worth getting the extra permitting for to do it. Sure. How do you feel like that has helped you when you started going into the military? having that mindset? I think the, uh, the situational awareness was just huge. Um, unlike the military, you're really on your own. Whatever team you're going to work with, that's, that's it. Uh, we couldn't expect really any help from uh, any American agencies or any of the local police, uh, even as far as worrying about medical care. Uh, we had several uh, paramedic trained people with us at all times because you couldn't, simply couldn't trust getting to a hospital and having them treat you in case there are any injuries, so. Okay. So after private security, you said you started doing, working with, uh, in the gun industry. Absolutely. Um, I was uh, uh, going to several different uh, facilities to, <laughs> to train and to keep sharp with firearms. I'd been going to one in particular for uh, many years and really started part-time when, when work was a little slower and uh, it just kind of grew from there. Uh, I worked at the facility for probably about three years and then uh, when, when the work really dried up they offered me a management position there so I went ahead and took it. Okay. When did you decide or what was the reasoning to decide to join the military? I had first thought about it about two years before I joined, and I actually went to the National Guard first. Um, I did uh, the ASVAB testing and went through some of the process, and I scored very well. Um, but I, I really didn't get a good feel from it at the time, and I decided not to join. From there, um, I, it had just kind of been on my mind, and I decided to go ahead and go to a recruiter again. I think the primary focus was I really felt that there were so many people going overseas and and you know doing doing this thing overseas that uh, I, I don't know if it was such a drive to go do my part or um, it's really hard to describe I guess uh, I felt like you know if everyone else you know was was going and doing it maybe I should go and do it and, and uh, you know, see what it was all about, you know, sure. really. So it was, it was an interest simply, honestly, in, in deployment more than uh, joining the military. Okay. How old were you when you joined? 37. So being 37 and you're going through basic training with 
18, 17, 19 year olds, 20 year olds, how did that affect you as a person? Um, it was frustrating, very, very frustrating. Um, I think that that age group is a lot different than when I was that age. And, and you know, it could be my perspective on it. Maybe I was, was that kind of person uh, when I was 18 or, or 20 or 22, but uh, I, I really felt the immaturity was really at an all-time high, and it was uh, the basic training I didn't think was very difficult, but it was difficult because of all the, all the, the kids that I had to overcome and get to do their jobs and really straighten up and start you know, listening to drill sergeants, which you know, obviously they hadn't listened to their parents their whole life, and, and being told what to do and actually doing it was a really foreign concept for them. So while I enjoyed basic training, it was a huge, huge frustration for me. And you went through basic training out in uh, Fort Leonard? That's okay. correct. That's correct. What, um, let's break down the timeline. So you had the frustration of uh, dealing with the immaturity. Um, how do you think that your previous work experience helped you while you were at basic training? Um, I don't know if the previous work experience really helped me so much as just just being older and more mature and just simply having more life experience. Um, being able to conceptualize what you know the drill sergeants wanted uh, very very easily on, on simple and complex tasks. Uh, it, uh, I don't want to say the, the firearms portion helped me at all. The private security probably did in in the situational awareness and being aware of security, which is obviously huge in the military. Well, I imagine being working in the firearms sector, when you actually went out to the rifle ranges, you naturally would probably excel. I, I did. I did a lot better than than a lot of other people did. There's uh, there's less and less firearms experience as the generations grow. So, if nothing else, on a mechanical side, it was it was very easy for me to conceptualize, you know, the the breakdown, how the firearms operated, uh, what kind of care and maintenance it really needed. Uh, whereas uh, there were a lot of the young soldiers who had either never shot before or had very very limited experience. So it, it was it was easy to get a, a really big leg up on that, that portion of basic training, if nothing else. Okay, and you chose a combat engineer for your, your specific area, is that yes. correct? Yes, yes I did. Going, going forward from basic, you did basic, did you do AIT at the same time, your job it was, training? It was OSET, which was uh, basic training followed immediately by the AIT or your MOS portion. Uh, to where you get all the on-the-job or your job skills training right afterwards. So it, it blended seamlessly really into it. So Okay, and that means you would have got out also in 2008? Uh, 2009 okay. is, is when I got out of basic training. Okay, so let's go from 2009 you deployed at one year. When did you deploy? Oh, uh, 2010. Okay, so let's go from the end of your basic training AIT and talk about how you were with as a soldier going as in the reserves? Right out of basic training, um, I got out, I went to visit the unit that I'm in currently, which is 323 Engineer Company out of Spartanburg, South Carolina. Uh, I went up to the unit uh, within the week of graduating. Uh, and that following, that following month, uh, we had a month-long training session in California, uh, which, was, which was really good. Uh, it was a lot different than basic training, of course, uh, and it was the gear up for deployment, which was to be the following year. So a month out in California uh, in the desert was very similar to what I experienced in Afghanistan as far as weather and terrain. And really being able to uh, operate as a route clearance combat engineer throughout that training was, was invaluable, totally invaluable. Um, the month-long training there, uh, when that was done, I uh, just started drilling normally, uh, one weekend a month, and just gaining more and more knowledge of really the Army 
and how the Army operates, and through there, how a combat engineer operates with route clearance. Um, I'm trying to remember the timeline from there. Uh, we went to Christmas drill, and then I can't, I can't quite remember when it was that we mowed from there. Um, I can't remember a specific timeline from there when we actually mowed in 2010. I think it was January. Uh, we went January uh, to pre mob and then followed right right into MOB. So it was it was a very quick progression from getting out of basic, uh, going to the the pre mob training that summer, and then actual pre mob uh, into uh, the MOB itself. And where did uh, you mobilize out of? Fort McCoy, Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsin during the winter would seem kind of kind of cold. It uh, it was uh, pretty pretty different than uh, what we were to experience when we first hit, Af hit Afghanistan. It would have been fantastic had we been able to uh, go in the winter at McCoy and then go to the the winter in Afghanistan. Unfortunately, we hit the summer right away. A lot of our training, I think, was bogged down a little bit because we were dealing with. Uh, a lot of snow and super cold weather, uh, so it, that always slows up training. We went uh, directly uh, from there, really, to Afghanistan. It was just turning into spring in Wisconsin, and we went to boiling hot in Afghanistan. So that that was kind of tough, but I don't I don't see how they could have avoided it. So backtracking just a little bit. When you joined the military, what was your push for the Army as opposed to the Navy where your, where your dad served? Um, really no interest in the Navy itself. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of good personnel out there in the military that, that have their, their hands in this operation, but the Navy isn't as uh, directly involved as far as being on the ground and, and going out and seeing the country itself and dealing with the populace, which was an interest to me. Uh, the major drive for the Army was uh, a lot of it had to do with the ease in which I could join. Uh, but honestly, the Army was going to be the only branch that was going to take me for two reasons, my age and the heavy amount of tattooing that I have. There were uh, a lot of restrictions uh, from the Air Force, uh, which I didn't have any interest in. The Marine Corps was of interest, but they were not taking anyone at the time with uh, as heavily tattooed and at my age group. Okay, so moving back to now you're you've gone through training, you're mobilized, we hit ground in Afghanistan and what's your experience when you actually got over there besides it being blistering hot? Besides being blistering hot, um, it kind of a breakneck speed. Uh, it was uh, a very quick changeover from the unit we took over. Um, the unfortunate thing is, is that we don't have a lot of the same equipment to train on in the U.S. So it's, you've got to learn a lot of information about the equipment and the area that you're going to be in. And it's, you're really hitting the ground running very, very fast. Learning uh, a lot of the communication devices, which we didn't have. A lot of the, the Duke systems um, that uh, shut down signals. The vehicles themselves, we had a little experience, but not a ton of experience because we simply don't have a ton of it in the U.S. Um, so learning that equipment and getting out there and, and learning the job. When we first went out there, it was a left seat, right seat. So a lot of the former unit we were taking over for, they would accompany us on the beginning missions. And uh, it, didn't, it didn't last long. They were with us very, very briefly. So learning that job as quickly as possible was just key, key to being out there and doing the job properly and being safe. And what was your primary position while your uh, entire mobilization? Uh, during the mobilization, uh, I primarily held one job, which was uh, the lead truck, the front truck, as the uh, gunner. Uh, the gunner's uh, job, of course, being security, uh, that situational awareness being key on that. Uh, lead truck gunner is the first one really to see everything so that was uh, that was my primary job I did drive once or twice uh, but begged back for the job of lead truck gunner I really enjoyed it primarily because I just knew everything that was going on I got to see where everything was 
and uh, the, the enjoyment of being able to direct some of the stuff that was happening outside the vehicle. Uh, making sure that the locals were safe and out of the way and that our vehicles were able to keep rolling as well as doing that primary security for the front. As a lead truck gunner, did you feel like you had added responsibility from all the other gunners in the entire uh, route clearance? Package? Absolutely, absolutely. And it's, and it's not a detractor to the other gunners, just being that lead truck gunner being out front. Uh, really, partly security, partly traffic director, uh, partly translator, um, getting the locals to understand where you wanted them, what you wanted them to do. Uh, even if they did or did not want to do what you were telling them, uh, getting your point across uh, and being able to, to do that to keep the mission rolling, uh, I think was, um, it was a huge responsibility, uh, but it, you know, honestly, it was something I really enjoyed doing, being, being part of it. I'm not someone who likes to sit around and, and you know, be in the middle of the convoy and, and not, not having access to all the what's going on and all the information. When you were selected for that position, what went through your mind? Uh, I was actually very excited. Uh, I have uh, a, my squad leader at the time um, had asked me if I wanted to do it. And there were some, obviously, some driving positions available. And uh, he asked me if I wanted to do it. It was something I wanted to do. So honestly, I was, I was real, real excited about getting that position. Um, now, my idea of what that position would be and what it turned out to be, you know, just two different things, never having doing it, and it was a lot more than I thought it would be, but it was, it was definitely worth it, definitely worth it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have taken any other position. After you did the left seat, right seat with the other unit that you were replacing, how long until you actually went on your first mission? Uh, if my memory is correct, uh, I would say, I think they did one or, I think it was a total of two missions where we did left seat, right seat. Um, and it, it's not as if it was 50% the other unit and 50% us. We usually had three or maybe four people on the total convoy. I think the, the last mission we ran, it was only, only one person in the actual convoy. Uh, their, their lieutenant, their uh, platoon leader went with us on, on the last mission uh, just, to, just to help us along that one last time. So it was, it was a very, very quick changeover. Okay. Um, I see that you served in uh, Operation Strong Eagle. If you could take me, and that was about three weeks into being overseas, if you could take me into the events leading up to actually going on this big operation. Sure, absolutely. It was, it was very quick. Uh, before we did this uh, large operation. It, um, what had happened, we, we got into country. Um, we uh, went immediately to Jalalabad. Uh, we trained up with our vehicles. We, we did some missions there in Jalalabad. And we were kind of en route to being uh, positioned in Abad for several months. And the Strong Eagle was very, very close to that area. Um, <clears throat> with this, with this train up, this very quick train up, um, you know, I, I think we had a lot of stuff that that we had learned from the train up. But Strong Eagle definitely uh, trained us further. Um, really, leading up to it, it was it was really just that information intake, uh, getting used to uh, not just obviously the temperature, but the equipment. Um, getting used to communications, everything else, and I'm very glad we had that three weeks to kind of hammer out all the, the little things. Really getting used to working as, a, as teams, uh, squads and platoons and vehicles in an entire convoy and getting that together and everyone feeling comfortable. I think there were several small position changes to uh, really make things run a little smoother, work a little better, but for the most part we stuck with you know what we had. So uh, leading up to it, we really didn't encounter very much at all. Uh, they, we hadn't found any IDs yet, which of course is our primary focus is route clearance. Uh, but we had run, I want to say probably five or six smaller missions before then. Okay, so um, 
If you don't mind, let's talk about Strong Eagle a little bit. Sure. What what went through your mind and what happened that day? <laughs> the the basis of the operation was there was a, a small village that was believed to uh, house a, a lot of um, Taliban, Al Qaeda, and their estimates were a little shy um, as far as how many were out there. It was to cover um, a lot of different groups. It was a pretty big named operation. Uh, there was lots of air support. Uh, we were to clear the, the route or the road going to this village. And as well as us, we had 101st, and we also had a, a lot of local nationals, uh, the ANA, Afghan National Army that came with us. They were the front push to go out there and uh, we went out there and uh, it, it changed very quickly. Uh, when we got near the village uh, there was, we took a lot of fire. Uh, mortar fire, small arms fire um, and it, I, I think overall with the, the mission itself, which I think individually everyone did very well, I think it was a lot to try to coordinate and um, it, uh, it, it fell apart to a point somewhat quickly. Uh, as the operation went, we ended up having to stop. Local nationals went forward, they took heavy fire. Uh, the 101st uh, pushed forward, they took heavy fire. Uh, they ended up uh, taking so much fire, they pushed back. Uh, the air support that we had ran through all their ammunition and had to leave and they brought back even more air support. Uh, the forces that we encountered were doubled or tripled uh, initial estimates and uh, they really had to regroup. They did very well once the regrouping happened and we got a lot more air support. Uh, but um, the local nationals really took uh, probably most of the casualties in that operation. Uh, 101st uh, fared quite a bit better but they took casualties as well. Uh, as far as our route clearance patrol, we didn't take any casualties, but our vehicles were hit very, very hard with small arms fire. Uh, RPGs, luckily we never got mortared, and uh, for a while we were kind of stuck in the front while everyone else regrouped in the rear and then came back. We were able to uh, turn around and, and get out, and they, for the most part, I don't want to say canceled, the mission, but they, they did stop it short because it was much more than, than they had anticipated. How long was the engagement, the firefight? Uh, the firefight itself, we were out there for a minimum, I believe, of eight or nine hours. Uh, from probably, probably when we started out, uh, we took fire very, very quickly. Uh, we had hit a point on this fairly short route, uh, and the, the firefight lasted for quite a while. Quite a while. I think we would have been in a lot more trouble had we not had that key air support uh, to, to help us out. So as the gunner, you're obviously shooting back at the enemy. Absolutely. What, um, what was your method of doing that effectively so that way you could conserve ammo but still shoot at the, the enemies fighting, trying to fight you? The, uh, a lot of the, the fire that uh, I was able to direct directly at uh, some of the enemy, um, it, was, it was limited in where I would actually be able to engage the enemy. There were some uh, ranges that I wasn't able to obtain. Uh, again, we, we had stopped and a lot of the, uh, the 101st and the local National Army had pushed farther forward. They engaged them a lot. And I think we took uh, we took some of the extra fire from that. Um, when I was able to to fire at them, I, I of course did. In between there, we were uh, just pretty much cover firing, which is short bursts with long periods in between uh, to con conserve a lot of the ammunition. On the mission, we we brought a lot of ammunition, not being sure what we would encounter, and we ran through almost all of it. The other portion of that was is that uh, a lot of uh, a lot of the 101st had run out of ammunition, and we actually supplied them with some of our ammunition. Yep. So that that worked out well for them, as far as us carrying too much. Now, being older and more mature, how did that affect you when you start getting shot at 
and you were told to return fire, or did was it instinctive? How did that go through your head? Um, it, I, I guess it seemed kind of natural. Um, you know, I, I guess everyone would experience this all in all in different ways. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I guess in my estimation, when you know, when fired upon, you fire back. You know, uh, I think I was probably able to keep a lot calmer, maybe than than younger soldiers, uh, maybe not. I really don't. I really would hate to make statements on how other people felt or how other people dealt with it. Um, not not being in their shoes, not being from their background. Um, you know, you're never comfortable in that kind of situation. But I felt uh, I felt comfortable and confident. A lot of that stemmed from uh, the closeness of our. Uh, uh, platoon, uh, being confident in our leadership, uh, which I, I definitely was. Uh, all the leadership above me, I felt very confident with. So it it really, I, I never thought about it in those terms. Like you know, what do I do? Oh my goodness, you know, what's going on? I felt you know confident. Uh, my TC, uh, the leader of the vehicle, uh, directed me what to fire at, and I did because that's you know that's what you're supposed to do. Um, the other portion of that is is calling out things that you see. Uh, our vehicle, I think, in particular, was was very sharp as far as situational awareness, uh, keeping eyes on everywhere, making sure we knew what was going on. So it, uh, I don't want to say it was perfectly seamless, but it, it certainly seems that way in hindsight that we were able to identify what was going on, where targets were at. Um, what what definitely helped was. Uh, both the TC and driver uh, directing, directing me where to fire and telling me where my where my shots were. So that was that was definitely key. Were you awarded anything for, during that mission? Uh, I was awarded a um, Army uh, Accommodation Medal with Valor uh, from that uh, from that particular engagement. So with Valor, that seems pretty prestigious as far as. Um, most people don't necessarily get the valorous get the, the valor part. Well, we you know we were out there for uh, an extreme amount of time, taking very heavy fire for uh, what seemed like forever. Um, I really have a hard time with awards uh, as far as um, saying, hey, you know, I got this award or I got that award. Uh, I I really do look at it like. You know, I was out there doing what I was told to do, and I, you know, I accomplished it or I did it well. Um, the, the awards, I guess, to me don't don't mean as much. I was I was grateful, obviously, for the award, and uh, you know what it what it means to get that award is is prestigious. I mean, I, I felt very good about getting the award, but I, I think a lot more of my focus on on you know getting the mission done and primarily the safety of, of myself and everyone else in the platoon really really took precedence. So it was, it was nice to get the award, but um, you know, I was just very thankful that, that everyone was able to, to get out of that mission from our unit uh, with, with no major casualties. So moving forward, you stayed the, the lead, gun, lead gunner. Um, how did maybe did that award maybe help push and motivate you to do better and better every time when you went out? Absolutely. Well, uh, the I didn't know about the award so much later. Um, I think uh, uh, if nothing else, the the situation in the mission itself pushed me to uh, you know want to make sure that I stayed in that position uh, because I I did uh, of course I enjoyed the position but. Uh, um, you know, having being the one to have the eyes on to be in the front was such a motivator for me that that I couldn't, I really couldn't imagine myself in other positions. The few times I did have to take other positions, I was honestly very miserable. Um, you know, it just uh, it wasn't it wasn't the same. And I really wouldn't. I I've talked to other people about it, and you know, I've gotten some comments like, "Oh, you just you know, a, a adrenaline junkie," or. You know, whatever it was, I just I really felt that that position fit me, and uh, you know what I could do for that position, I, it just felt right to me. What were some of your pre-mission duties? And I know that every mission wasn't the same, 
But was there a structure, was there a routine that you got into prior to going outside um, the base? Absolutely. Uh, the Everyone had their own position, obviously. There's a commander of every vehicle. Um, there's, uh, you know, the platoon sergeant and the platoon leader who are in charge of the patrol. Uh, but what I found is that while the drivers were directly responsible for their vehicles, uh, especially in our vehicle, uh, most of the duties were shared. Uh, I started off with a 240, which was not very much to move back and forth, but uh, eventually I got, uh, I got a 50 caliber and uh, we had a lot of extra barrels. There was a lot more equipment later on with the missions. Uh, my driver helped me, and I definitely helped the driver with keeping and maintaining the vehicle itself. So we definitely got in, into a routine very quickly of making sure everything was stocked, water, food, ammunition, uh, make sure the vehicle was running correctly, uh, any maintenance that we would do on the off days, uh, which we called maintenance days. Uh, really, really it was uh, a group effort. Uh, at least with our vehicle, it was always a group effort, getting everything to where it should be. Uh, if you don't have everything in the vehicle itself, you, you'll know right away. And it's a mistake you won't make twice if you're short of water or food or whatever it is. So uh, we really, I don't believe, had any problems with that. So the, the responsibilities really span across the board. Uh, I hear other people who have gone overseas and, oh, I gunned. Well, you know, what were your responsibilities? Well, I dealt with the gunning. You know, we didn't, we didn't feel that was the case, that, you know, we had a whole vehicle or a whole convoy to deal with. So there were a lot of times where other people might need some assistance. You just ran and, and helped them, got whatever special equipment or whatever else they needed. What, what were, um, with your, your mission or whatnot, what else did you, um, feel like as you were going out there going on all these missions how did it like affect you mentally throughout the whole tour obviously you said you were focused um, and you were driven but was there a, ever a, a time where there was a change I I don't think that there there really was there's like with anything else you can get uh, the feeling of monotony after a while um, I think a lot of my focus ended up being uh, mission driven because I didn't want to get into a groove to where you know I would I would just do the same thing over and over and over again I really focused on the small details uh, I think a lot of people will have problems with overseas deployments uh, because they focus on other things and it and it changes them heavily um, I I don't feel like the deployment itself changed me um, as much as it as it did others. Uh, I felt like I had a pretty good knowledge base of what was going to go on before I left. Uh, it was a, a little different, of course, minor differences, uh, you know, throughout the deployment than what I thought, but I had a, I had a fairly good idea of, of what I was going to encounter and, and uh, I just, I didn't focus on negatives, I didn't focus a whole lot on family and home, uh, which I think just put people in tailspins of, of misery. So I, I try to focus primarily on, on the missions itself. Now you had mentioned off days. Was that a common occurrence? It was not a common occurrence. Um, which, you know, that's fine. That's what I get paid for. Uh, the, the few days off we had, and we were very uh, mission heavy. Uh, we ended up performing very well as a, as a platoon. And we were, we were asked to do a lot of extra routes, I think, because of that. Uh, we got assigned special stuff, and because we could handle it, we just did more missions. Um, uh, the days off, mostly, um, I can't I can't say they're days off because it's always uh, equipment and mostly vehicles. You need to make sure that everything is restocked, that you're going to have enough food, that you're going to have enough water, that your ammunition supplies up. But the the vehicles were really primary on those days off because they do break down very often, and they're put through probably more than the manufacturers ever expected. Um, as far as actual time off, when we, when we had it, uh, you know, we, we definitely utilized it. Um, you know, as far as people getting a hold of their families and, 
and uh, you know, kick them back and try not to think of uh, you know where you're at or what you're doing. No, I, I imagine you made friends while you were over there. Did you guys ever do any anything to help pass the time if you did have a little bit of downtime? We we certainly did. Um, uh, there there are a lot of people I think who will sit in their tent or wherever they're staying and and just kind of you know, watch movies on their laptop the whole time. And there's certainly enough of that going on. Uh, there was. Uh, there was a lot of stuff that, that we did to keep it lively. Uh, we made uh, several uh, comedic short films. Um, there was uh, a lot of competitive Xbox playing. Um, and there was uh, a lot of general horsing around, which was pretty harmless. But uh, a lot of it was uh, good bonding and I think uh, brought us closer together for actual work, which you know, I, I don't know if anyone from the outside could ever really conceptualize, you know, what what it's like uh, to be under such heavy duress overseas, uh, and then having that bonding time and that that free time was so heavily utilized. It really brought us closer together. Yeah, it sounds like it was uh, good team building exercises, even even just with Xbox. Abs absolutely, um, and again outside perspective is you're playing video games you know you were you're making movies you know little you know silly movies and it, a lot of it was blown off steam a lot of it was you know again from the outside perspective just kind of ridiculous but you know when you you can work with someone all day long but if you don't know them you don't know, get their quirks and, and their mannerisms then you're not going to work as well together and, and a lot of this stuff uh, you got to know everyone a lot better and you were able to to make adjustments for that especially because you knew them um, the the Xbox again seems kind of seems kind of silly but uh, you know just that basic teamwork and and doing some I don't want to say exercises but you know going through and, and doing some of this stuff really really brought it together and really established uh, leadership and, and the ability to follow Okay, so uh, you make it through to deployment, and now you're back home. How how are you a different person now that you have been over there and actually dealt with a lot of things that you had an idea about but you weren't necessarily ready for? Absolutely, I would say probably the biggest change. I would I would say before the deployment. Uh, you know, I would probably describe myself as, as fairly laid back. Um, you know, I don't I don't get real upset or, or uptight over you know small issues or even large issues. Uh, I found after the deployment I was uh, probably more relaxed than what I was previously because you know what you encounter day to day just doesn't compare to being shot at or blown up, and a lot of little things just you know. I, just didn't didn't matter as much and it wasn't so much a, a carefree like you know I don't care if my bills get you know piled up or anything like that it's just the my my idea of a stress level definitely definitely changed you know I've got to wait at a traffic light you know I, there's I just can't imagine stomping my feet and honking the horn and giving someone the finger over that now when you know it's just a traffic light it's just nothing nothing is worth all that aggravation and I think that was uh, some of that was a learned skill set uh, or an enhancement of a, a previous skill set. Um, I I haven't found anything that I think, oh my goodness, you know, that's a real negative change. But again, I don't I don't think I changed as as much as a lot of other people did. Now you had mentioned uh, getting shot at and getting blown up. You being the the lead truck. Uh, you would think that that would be a higher target. Did you ever actually encounter getting blown up during um, the tour? The, you're, uh, you're absolutely right. As the lead truck, you would think that uh, um, you would be probably first hit on, especially with IEDs. Um, a lot of 
a lot of small arms fire, they want you in a certain position, so sometimes uh, the middle of the convoy would get hit quicker, but especially with the uh, IEDs, um, the, the reason we're the lead truck is to, you know, maybe, maybe catch it first. Uh, we employed on our RG31 a mine roller, which is a device, obviously, that goes on the front, uses pressure to, uh, to actually catch the IEDs before it hits the truck itself. Um, through whatever miracle, uh, we were never hit once. Uh, we, had, uh, we had a lot of other vehicles hit by IEDs, and just through the luck of the draw, we, we were never, uh, we never actually detonated an IED with our truck in particular. As far as small arms fire, we did certainly take that pretty much uh, a, a lot like some of the other vehicles. Uh, but as far as IEDs, we just, we never got hit, which I am not complaining about. Yeah, it sounds pretty fortunate. It, it definitely is. It definitely is. Now, you're back in the States, uh, 2011 time frame? Yes. What, uh, how was the transition going back from high strong, active duty, you're overseas, now you're back to reserve one week in a month. How, how are you as uh, getting maybe a leadership role? or? Uh, one of the primary differences as far as uh, my focus in the military is very shortly after I got back, instead of uh, being a team member, uh, I was uh, promoted to a team leader position. Um, that obviously being a lot different, uh, you're in charge of soldiers instead of being one of them. Um, it was definitely a welcome, welcome change. Uh, I definitely enjoyed being part of, part of the leadership process, being able to, to help uh, guide not only soldiers that we went with, but new soldiers that, that came in. Um, you know, I'd like to think that uh, you know, some of the experience overseas definitely plays a role in, in being able to uh, get soldiers on the right path, uh, get, them, get them trained uh, to do what their, their focus is, which you know, in our platoon is definitely route clearance. And having that, that experience, I think, is invaluable uh, for me as a, as a leader to go ahead and, and push them out, get them as much training as possible. Okay, so you've been in the military for how many years now? Uh, five years in November. And you signed up for eight, eight years. years. Eight years. Are you planning on reenlisting and going forward with the military, or was this a kind of a one one time deal for you? Uh, when I first joined up, uh, it was kind of a see how it goes uh, sort of thing. Uh, my civilian career is extremely busy, and this will probably be uh, the only contract that I signed with the military. It's nothing against the military. I, you know, I can't say that I haven't had a great experience because I certainly have. But uh, you know, my primary focus, uh, you know, eventual retirement, uh, making other plans, it definitely centers around my civilian career as opposed to the military. Okay. So when will you actually be done with your your contract? You said it's eight years. Eight so. years. That's correct. Okay. Um, any, any, do you think that your experience overseas and uh, your time in the military, looking maybe 10, 15 years down the road, do you think that that experience will help make you who you are uh, 10 or 15 years down the road? Um, you know, it, it's, it's hard to say uh, 10 or 15 years down the road. Um, I think more than anything, the the experience of I'm not going to say of, of combat or or of anything else is necessarily going to be a, um, a primary focus for me. But uh, as far as being in the military and seeing how the military itself operates, uh, chain of command, communications, uh, I definitely think that is changed a lot of my perspective uh, more than a, a deployment has um, and I think I utilize a lot of that almost on a day-to-day -day basis especially in a management position in the civilian sector uh, it's changed my philosophies on on several things or at least my perspective and I do I do things a little bit differently because of that and I think that's not only affecting me now but it certainly will in 10 or 15 years well, John, I'd like to thank you for your service and thank you for your time today.
Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Have a great day. You too.